welcome to the Playwright Center. My name is Jeremy Cohen, I'm continuing recording. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I am the producing artistic director here. And on behalf of our staff and our board and the over 2,300 playwrights that we serve every year, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the penultimate event in our 2020-21 season. Tonight, we celebrate longtime family writers, Diana Sun and Susan Sunke Stanton. So please clap and cheer at home and welcoming them back to the center. Disturb your neighbors with clapping and cheering. We have folks tuning in online from all around the globe to be with us tonight, including a number of our great Parker theaters. And in the middle of this moment of great activism and hope, we are gathering together to tell stories as we have for 49 years here at Playwright Center. The Playwright Center acknowledges that we are on the traditional land of the Dakota people and the Anastabe Ojibwe people. We offer our gratitude to this land for the privilege of gathering and sharing stories and for the work of native and of indigenous activists past, present and future who steward this land and challenge us to be partners rather than owners of it. As we gather virtually via the internet still, we at Playwright Center reaffirm our commitment to learning how best we can continue to advocate alongside our myriad native communities. And we invite all of you at home to do the same, to learn about and support some of the incredible native organizations here in the Twin Cities. You can go to our website for more information and Julia has uh, placed in the chat a link to a whole host of incredible organizations. We're also excited to continue our long-standing partnership with the Dramatist Guild Foundation uh, with tonight's conversation. Each year, our two organizations come together to share discussions with some of our most brilliant artists, thinkers, and leaders. Since March of 2020, DGF has given out over, get ready for it, $1.3 million in emergency grants. DGF emergency grants continue to be available so that you know for writers in need of financial help with rent, with medical bills, childcare, et cetera. DGF also offers mental health and wellness grants. To apply and to learn more, please, please visit dgf.org. And thank you again to our amazing partners at the Drama Guild. And at Playwright Center, we, not uh, to be uh, sitting quietly on our, resting on our laurels, we have been extremely busy since March of 2020. During the past 14 months, we have created 135 public programming events like tonight. We've created over 600 paid jobs for artists during that time. And we have welcomed more than 6,000 audience members from around the world. Remembering if you were with us in person, we'd be sitting in a 99 seat house. So it's been a busy 14 months for us. And to conclude our 49th season, I'm so excited to welcome back to Playwright Center the incredible Heather Raffo in conversation next Wednesday, June 23rd. Heather has been in person and in online residence uh, with us for the past two years, creating an absolutely stunning new piece of immersive theater for both the stage and for your screen. And Heather's gonna be sharing about the journey of that project and about how do we keep theater live now while also centering the audiences that we seek to connect with who maybe aren't making it to the theater. So if you're interested in joining for that event, uh, Julia has popped the link into the chat. Um, it would be so great to have you join us for that as well. Uh, we are currently enrolling for our fall 2021 online semester long courses in playwriting and in writing for television. So please reach out to Sarah Myers uh, if you're interested in the chat. Before we dive in tonight, just a few bits of business to welcome you and let you know how the structure of this conversation is going to go, which is basically we're going to have a lot of fun just talking and hanging out. Um, you will be able to, as Julia mentioned, see and hear both Diana and Susan, as you could do now, but they won't be able to see or hear you until the Q&A portion. If you have trouble at any point, you can chat uh, privately to Julia and she will do her best to help you out. We, as you know, are recording the conversation today uh, as Playwright Centers um, really uh, puts at the center of all we do accessibility and inclusion. Uh, so that those who are not able to join us at the time can still see this incredible conversation. So hello friends on the recording. Diane and Susan are gonna talk for the little while and then reserve the last third of the conversation or so from questions from you. Uh, when they're about five minutes out from the questions, Susan's going to remind you to start typing your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, though you can also ask your questions throughout the evening. All right, tiny bit more history and then I promise I'm going to shut up. In December of 1998, that's right people, 1998, I flew to New York to see the world premiere of Diana Sun's breathtaking, funny, and heartbreaking new play at the time, Stop Kiss. 
Sandra O oh and Jessica Hecht played the leads and I was blown away. A few days later at the end of my trip, I had one slot left to see a play and I was a very hungry younger person who had a lot more tolerance for seeing lots of plays all at the same time. And I of course went back and saw Diana's play a second time so that I could really study and learn the construction of the piece as it moves back and forth in time and to understand a whole new way of telling stories. And as a queer man myself, what did it mean to have this story centered at that moment in time? Shortly before, it would turn out that that play was developed here in our Play Labs Festival. So we're really thrilled to have Diana back. The next year, uh, 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 still 99, I guess, the next year I started Naked Eye Theater Company in Chicago. And the following year, the brilliant Jenny Bacon would direct a production for us of Stop Kiss that absolutely stunned audiences in Chicago. I knew that Diana's voice had to be one of the first ones for us to express who we were as a young theater company. Always, always brilliant playwright voices leading the way. Cut to 2014, when then rising playwright rock star Susan Sinhe Stanton became a core writer at Playwright Center. We immediately fell in love with her play Seek about the mysterious disappearance of Agatha Christie in Susan's home state of Hawaii. We would go on to develop much more of her work, including a partnership with Artness Curtis Repertory Theater in Portland around her play We the Invisibles, which then moved on to an incredible production that I got to see at the world-renowned Humana Festival the following year. Susan's voice has proven one of the most important during my 11 year tenure here at Playwright Center. And I was so excited when Lily Tongue Crystal and our amazing colleagues at Theater Move here, who we part with all the time in the Twin Cities, produced Susan's play, Today is My Birthday, in a phenomenal production during the pandemic. I'm so excited to welcome these amazing artists back to Playwright Center. So I'm going to do a brief bio of Susan, and then I'm closing off my video. Susan Sunhi Stanton, here we go. Susan is a playwright a television writer and a screenwriter based between New York and London and originally from Hawaii. She is a producer and writer of HBO's Succession for which she has won a WGA and Peabody Award. Upcoming television work, wait for it, includes HBO and Sister Pictures, The Baby, Amazon's Modern Love, Amazon and Annapurna's Dead Ringers, Hulu and BBC's Conversations with Friends adapted from the novel by Sally Rooney as well as several other projects that Susan has in development. Her plays have been produced internationally and regionally here in the US, including the ones I mentioned earlier, Both Your Houses at ACT New Strands Festival with Amazing Crowded Fire, yay, Mina! Takarazuka at Club Thumb and at East West Players. The Things Are Against Us, just incredible at MCC and at Washington Ensemble Theater, The Underneath at the Amazing Kumu Kahua, Navigator at the brilliant, one of our most important theaters in this uh, whole country, Honolulu Theater for Youth, and so many more. Thank you for being welcome with us tonight. Please help me welcome to the screen the one and only Susan Suhi Stanton and Diana Sun. Have so much fun. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. That was so sweet. I, I love how much the Playwrights Center just always it's such a home for playwrights in every way. It just, I don't know, I feel very warm. <laughs> so now I would like to, I feel like Diana, you, you need no introduction, but I, I am going to introduce you. And um, um and read your amazing bio. Um, so to begin, Diana Sun is a playwright and a television writer and a producer. Her credits include The West Wing, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, Southland, Dirty John, Blue Bloods, American Crime, and 13th Reasons Why, which she served as a co-showrunner. She came to fame as a young playwright in 1998 with the extraordinary play Stop Kiss. In addition to Stop Kiss, Diana also is the author of plays Satellites, Boy, R.A.W., Because I'm a Woman, Fishes, and Others. Both Stop Kiss and Satellite premiered at the Public Theater in New York. Stop Kiss was extended at the Public Theater three times, making it the longest running non-musical play since A Chorus Line. It won the Glad Media Award for Best New York Production, and Diana won the Brilla Kerr Award for Playwriting. Diana's most recent project includes writing an adaptation of the novel If I Had Your Face by Francis Chow for Apple TV Plus with Jihei Park and recently sold a show to HBO Max on That Time I Loved You, a collection of connected short stories by Carrie Ann Leung. Um, so 
Diana, <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with you. Diana, I feel like I've gone back with you very long, but really just as a young writer, just obsessively reading your work and being changed by it, um, especially Stop Kiss, which I, I know Jeremy just, I, I, we'll just keep fangrinning you all, all night. That's why we're here. But um, but Diana and I, we, we also met at, um, at a Sundance playwriting retreat. It was, um, sort of remotely in Long Island at Flying Point. And we are all in these different cottages. And um, and I would always see Diana like walking and writing, we'd share meals. I think we picked apples in the orchard together. And, uh, and um, I would see you on the beach. We would take our separate, but sort of similarly timed long walks, so. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And we had very, very nice dinners. Yes. Right, it was like me, you, Melissa James Gibson, um, Steve Cawson, mm -hmm. um, who am I missing? Sarah Colangelo. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Was, there, was there one more playwright or was that it? Oh my gosh. I think that was, now I'm terrified. I think that was it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that was a great experience. But I also, I have to say, I do want to, um, uh, I had a, I have a, um, a specific story about when we were workshopping Stop Kiss at the Playwright Center because I actually so I received an email from Christina Anderson today. Do you know Christina, Susan? I know her very well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you know this story, but I met Christina at the Playwright Center when I don't know if you guys still do it, but there was a high school program, um, and so Christina performed her play, her solo show, um, conf confession, confection, con oh my God, confections, <laughs> because I have a sweet tooth, um, confessions of a teenage black diva. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually didn't get to see her show because I was like furiously working on rewrites um, before rehearsal, but I met my director, Joe Bonnie, um, in the lobby outside the auditorium where Christina was performing her play. So I could, okay, as Joe and I were just kind of talking, going over my changes, you know, I could hear Christina, like, a, you know, it, you know, the end of her show in terms of, I could hear her performance. And then it ended, you know, and then it was quiet, you know, I guess the show ended. And then the, the house erupted with like applause and stomping of feet and screaming. Um, and as the doors opened and everybody filed out, it, everyone was just beaming. Um, they were just so, you, you know, excited, inspired, you know, uh, by Christina and her work. And so she was like the last to, and to come out. And I was just like, wow. So I was like, I like, said, so what did you just do? Like, what did you do? What did I miss? Um, and so we just, you know, talked a little bit there and, and then she um, she came to see the reading of Stop Kiss and she stayed for the talk back. And I, um, she mentioned this in her email to me today. And I have to say that I'm very proud of this, which, which is um, I had a prepared list of questions that I wanted to ask the audience. Like I have just seen so many talk backs, just they all start off really positive. Like, I love this and I love that. And like, you know, oh, this was hilarious. This was very moving. And then by the end, they're like, and the part I really hated was when this happened. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I had decided um, to uh, honestly, just not to give room for that, you know, um, kind of unhelpful comment. So, um, so I had a list of questions you know, because I was also very, you know, I was rewriting the play. Um, and so I just wanted to know, had I achieved this list of things, which I had set out to do in my rewrite. So I came out for the talk back, you know, the tr traditional fan came out on stage and they opened it up. And I said, well, I, actually, I would like to ask you a few guys a few questions. And I was like, when did you think Callie and Sarah were attracted to each other? Mm -hmm. Was it clear to you that this blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, okay, thank you very much. And like afterwards, Christina was like, wow. She's like, is that how you're supposed to do that? You know, and I was like, I don't know, but you know, I didn't want to just sit around and just, you know, let people um, say things that weren't helpful. 
um, to me. And so she, 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 she was emailing me about something else. <clears throat> um, and she just said, I, she said, I still remember that. And I still do that mm. uh, myself. And, and that honestly means the world to me. Oh, that's such a great, that's such a great thing to bring up also in terms of the talk back, because I mean, they are not just ostensibly actually for the playwright. And I think there's a sense of you just sort of feel as vulnerable as you can be because you just listen to your play being read yeah. and to say, you know, we do like the sort of Liz Lerman, like questions or what kind of feedback do you want to receive? But sometimes it sort of feels like a free for all. And I think to come at it and say, I just want to ask these questions and here, and that's all I want to hear. And that's the point where I'm at, where it's the most productive to me as a writer. I mean, I think that's a great message to say, like you can reframe your talk back and yeah. make it specific, you know? Yeah, you don't have to be helpless. You don't have to be just completely, you know, vulnerable to like whatever people want to say about your play. I mean, and I know some playwrights, I've talked to some people and they're like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, I don't need to have that much control. I, I want to hear what people have to say. You know, and I think that can be part of the process too. It really depends where you are in the rewriting. I mean, at that point, I like really, you know, I knew what I was trying to achieve, achieve you know, but again, I do see like, it's, it's almost like a writer's room, Susan, in some ways, like where sometimes you feel like people are asking questions just because they want to be heard. Right. Do you know what I mean? And there's the questions that aren't the questions that go on for a long time. Um, yeah. One thing that Lark does, which I think is interesting, is that I mean, you can I think you can sort of ask the audience questions, but they have a form where you can put your questions on the form and fill it out, and then they hand in. People can write their feedback, and then as a playwright, you can. It, it's a kind of like a packet, right. <laughs> and you can choose if and when you want to receive all that audience feedback. And you can say, okay, I feel strong now or not. I mean, it's a little bit unfiltered because I think people can be freer in writing than if they're asking a question to your face. So it's a little scary, but you you sort of can say, when am I ready to get, you know, open the, the lever and get all that feedback. And yeah. it feels a little bit less vulnerable. Like I can wait till I'm at home and it's been a month or a few years or whenever I'm ready to receive the feedback from that reading from the audience. So, yeah. yeah. That's, I think that's great. But it's also like, I, I also feel like it's a good exercise, it's a good writing exercise, you know, to, to know ahead of time what you want to know about what you achieve because it forces you to write down and to identify for yourself what you were going after, right? Like, you know, again, especially in the rewriting process, not so much in the you know first couple drafts, maybe when you're still finding the play, but by the time you've really got a sense of like, this is what I want this play to be about, you know what I mean? This is the story I've committed to, you know, then I think it's good, it's a good writer's exercise to just go like, all right, what do I want people to understand from this? Mm -hmm. What do, did I want to be clear? What did I want to be ambiguous, you know? Um, and then that helps me even, even the questions themselves, sometimes I generate rewrites before I even get to ask the audience, you know? And for you, do you feel like a play is done at a certain point? I mean, like if you were gonna do, would you ever open up like Stop Kiss again? Or would you ask different questions with different audiences? Yeah, that's so tricky because, you know, right before the lockdown, the, there was a theater that wanted to revive it and, and I was meeting with a potential director and she asked me, you know, if I was interested in all reopening it up. And I, I really wasn't sure, like the way I hesitated just now, I was like, I, was like, I don't know, like on the one hand, I, I like to think I'm collaborative. I think, I think I am a better writer now, like just as a writer. I don't know if I'm a better writer of Stop Kiss. Um, because you're the person you were, like the thing that fueled you to write the play in that moment is, is different, right? Right, right. And there is a kind, yes. And there's, you know, because I've been through so much as a TV writer, you know what I mean? I have built all kinds of like reflexes in terms of anticipating what the questions will be. You know what I mean? Like that, like in terms of like, I didn't understand this. This wasn't clear. It was this what you're trying to say? Um, that I don't know if I would want to, I don't know, bring that. Um, I have some, I don't want to say they're defense mechanisms, but 
you know, because, you know, there is defensive writing. Like sometimes if you're like, if you're like, they're never going to understand, you know, that this is, you know, when she realized he was a drug addict, they're going to be like, what? I didn't get that. That was, that's, that's, you know, like, that's how we were supposed to have known just um, that. Um, so I do have defensive writing um, reflexes. And um, I don't know if I would want to bring that to soft kiss now. Um, and yes, I do think there is just tonally, there is a kind of um, I don't, youth, you know, um, to it that I don't think I don't know. I don't know if I could write it down. I have another play, Boy, which was actually my first uh, full-length play, which a theater mode did, I'm pretty sure. Um, and um, Michael Greif directed it. So that was actually my first major production. Michael Greif directed it. It was the first thing he directed after Rent. And I was, um, I had a day job at NYU. I was working, um, I was the equipment manager um, in the, in, in, in the uh, interactive telecommunications program. Um, and uh, you know, my phone, I had a f f rotary phone, you know, like, um, well, not rotary, but you know, like an actual hard landline that would yeah. ring. And usually it would be like, you know, like somebody saying like, I can't return the video camera today, please don't you know, please don't penalize me or something like that. But instead it was like Michael Breck saying like, hi, <laughs> you know, it, it really, he really did just call. Like I was just like ITP um, and he was like, and, and he was like, hi, this is Michael Greif. I'm the artistic director of La Jolla Playhouse. And I was like, hi. <laughs> um, and he's like, I read your Playboy and I really loved it. And I would like to direct it. How does that sound to you? I was like, that sounds great. <laughs> Um, but, uh, I don't know. How did I get onto that? How did I get onto that? How did I get onto boy? We were talking about, oh, youthfulness. I know. So, so boy, even though I worked on it really hard, um, um, and it was produced, you know what I mean? And, you know, by a really great director and he did a great job and it was, you know, it was a really great production. Um, but I don't think I, I don't think I stuck the landing hmm. uh, on the second act. I, I, I think I was still finding the play. Um, and I do, I don't let it, I, I, I don't let it be produced. I don't allow, I don't give permission for it to be produced that often because I, I feel like it's not done. Like every once in a while, the college is like, please let us do us no one will see it. Um, but uh, I, I would like to go back and fix it. Um, but it's, um, well, time, I, I, I don't know if I, I don't even have time to write a new play, um, let alone rewrite an old one, but um, again, I don't know if I have the youthfulness and, mm -hmm. and you know, and the, the younger point of view um, mm -hmm. to tell it. Because it's a story about, a, it's like, it takes place in kind of like a never, never land. Um, yeah. And this family has had, uh, the Uber Hollis family has, um, had um, five daughters and they want a son. And so when the sixth baby is born and it's another girl, um, they name her boy. Uh, and it was actually kind of based on my, my mom's story because my mom grew up in Korea and she, she has five sisters and they, they were so desperate for a son that they adopted a nephew. Um, but um, yeah, so it really is, it's like there's a, the main character is supposed to be a child, you know, like a kid. Um, and I, I don't know if I could do that. Well, so I'm thinking, so what, how do you find your, the, the spark? Like what, I mean, is it a, is it a hybrid of thing? Like what, what brings you towards wanting to write a new play? Like, do you start from a character? I mean, you've collaborated with Sandra Oh and a number of actors before, but, but just, you know, what is the first thing that becomes clear to you when you begin writing a play? Oh, yeah. How do I, I guess the word is like this, the situation. I'm trying not to use TV words, right? Um, but yeah, like with boy, I just, I totally remember I was sweeping, you know, my East Village apartment, you know, one day. And I don't know, I was just thinking about that, like that in Korea at that time, like the idea that you had to have a son was just like, you know, um, that that my my mother's family adopted a nephew like that just was so 
uh, that struck me and then I thought well what if like what is that what is that even about like do you know what I mean like what it, yeah. it just brings up the whole construct of gender you know what I mean and so I was like well what if you had a girl but just named her boy would that be fulfilling <laughs> enough do you know what I mean it's a good um, workaround right <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly exactly but then she falls in love with a girl and then so then that's problematic then it's like you're a boy um you're a girl um so uh yes um so it was that idea right it was just like you know basically you could say a gender social construct this is hmm. you know, sort of my question um and then i i guess stop kiss huh oh, no please go on please go on i mean i think similarly stop kiss was like is sexuality a social construct you know like and I don't know, oh, I know. I read an article that was in the paper, right? So the actual newspaper, and it was a very small article. And I can't remember it exactly. It's been a long time, right? But it was, there was a woman who had been in the military for her whole life. She was like a colonel. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish, was, did she want to retire? I don't remember. Anyway, I think she wanted to retire but um, her former partner, her former girlfriend, it was a very acrimonious breakup. And so the girlfriend outed her, right? And so this is way before Don't Ask, Don't Tell, right? You just couldn't be gay in the military. So her, her, her ex outed her. And if, if she were a lesbian, then it would mean she would lose her pension you know what I mean? She'd be dishonorably discharged, you know? So it was actually like a trial. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they produced like letters, the military, right? They were just like, your, your ex has provided, a, or, you know, with le like, are these, did you write these love letters to this woman? Oh, wow. And she said, yes, right? And it was like, are you a lesbian? And she said, no, right? Because to say that she was a lesbian, would mean she would lose everything. She would lose her life, you know what I mean? Like her the, the result of a life's work, you know? Um, and so, you know, that also was just like, you know, why does it matter what you call yourself? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so. Oh, well, I was thinking, I remember, I, 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 you know, read that you had this, you started off by wanting to be a novelist and then you saw the production um, at, of Hamlet at the public where Diana Venora was starring in Hamlet. And can you talk about, I mean, I, you talked, you mentioned about gen gender and different constructs, but what about that experience shifted you from wanting to be a novelist to wanting you to be a playwright? Oh yeah, I, it was the whole live theater aspect of it. I mean, it really blew my mind. So, cause I grew up in Dover, Delaware, right? And you know, small town, small state, um, and we didn't, you know, have a theater and, um, you know, my parents were like hardworking immigrants, you know, who, who owned the stores. So we didn't do arty stuff. Um, so art, art wasn't really part of my life. So I love to read. Um, and, um, I, I, some, oh, I know <laughs> I'm doing all, I feel like I'm doing all my, uh, my, my old songs tonight, but anyway, fourth grade, I decided I was going to be a writer um, because I was a, uh, I'm the second child, right, of Korean parents, and so my, I have an older brother, so I got I got this mom who's one of six daughters that was so obsessed with having a boy that they adopted a cousin, that um, when she had a son, like, right out of the gate he was dipped in gold. He oh. was like her winning ticket. And I mean, she loved me. I mean, this will sound familiar to many people, I'm sure. She loved me, but like a lot. Like, you know what I mean? I really felt that, you know, um, but I, I would just never measure up to him. He, he, he enjoyed a, a, a position of privilege that I would never get. Hmm. Um, so anyway, so when I was in the fourth grade, um, well, actually every year before that, right, we went to the elementary school across the street. So every year for state school, you know, the teacher goes down the list and says everybody's name, right? Susan Stanton, Diana's son, Diana's son, Diana's son. 
are you grandson's sister? Like every year, right? So, <laughs> so in the fourth grade, we were given a writing assignment over Thanksgiving. And um, we were supposed to write about what we were thankful for. Um, and so I wrote that I was thankful for my family. And I even like dug deep and found things to be thankful about for my brother. Mm -hmm. um, and so we all had to turn our fourth grade essays in. And then we went to recess. And then when we came back, Mrs. Russell said, I read all your essays. Uh, and I have to say that I'm very disappointed in all of you because the assignment was to write about something that you were thankful for. And all everybody wrote, anybody wrote about was about their toys or having TV in the room or having a bike or their games or whatever. She said only one person wrote about something that was actually, actually meaningful to her. And that person is Diana's son. I'm gonna hang her essay up on the wall so you all can read it. And that was it. That was it. That's all it takes. So, you know, I just, the importance of teachers cannot be overstated. Mm -hmm. um, and um, anyway, so yeah, so I would be a novelist because I was reading novels anyway, and short stories. And then uh, senior year of high school, I had this English teacher who was from uh, New York. She was a Jewish woman from Queens. I don't know how she ended up teaching English in Dover, Delaware. But we, um, we read Hamlet and we spent weeks actually dissecting it. And I loved it. I, I thought that Hamlet was like, to me, what Catcher in the Rye was for other people. Like mm -hmm. it just totally captured teen angst to me in the sense that like Hamlet knows what he wants to do. He knows what he should do, what he is morally compelled to do. And just over and over and over, he can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, about a, a week before, uh, so she arranged for this field trip. Public theater was doing a production of it. That's all we knew. That's all she knew. Mm -hmm. She bought the tickets, and then about a week before the trip, she said, "Okay, I just read a review of this production of Hamlet we're going to see, and I found something out that I didn't know when we bought the tickets, but it's too late to get a refund, so we're just going to go anyway, you know, and you know, and we'll have a new experience." And everyone's like groaning, "Oh, you know, what is it? What is it? What is it?" And she's like, well, apparently Hamlet is being played by a woman. And that made no sense to me because like the only, literally the only plays that I had seen were community productions of My Fair Lady and Fiddler on the Roof. So like when she said that Hamlet was gonna be played by a woman, I imagined a woman with like long blonde hair in a dress speaking mm -hmm. Hamlet's lines, right? Like, so, I just, you know, that just sounded stupid. So, so we went, you know, so we went uh, to New York and, um, you know, we went to the public theater, it was in the Ons Fokker and just the whole thing was just like, I can't say that it was like electrifying to me, but it was just like, kind of like, what, did, what are we all doing here? Like, wow, like, you know what I mean? Like, huh. I also thought it was so fancy, you know? Um, but then, uh, anyway, so then, you know, all the actors come out on the stage and I was like, this is amazing. Like just the fact that, cause it was in a proscenium stage, right? The Ons Walkers, like, you know, in the round. So, or, you know, anyway, I was just like, there's nothing separating us from the actors. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like they're right here. And the fact that any of us could just like get out of our seats and just like run onto the stage, you know what I mean? Or something, there was just something, there was an agreement already. There was some social contract, mm -hmm. um, you know, between the audience and the, and the actors that I was really kind of fascinated by. Like, wow, you know, like, how can we all agree to that? That's, ama uh, that's amazing though, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And it also just totally blew my mind that somebody could be just feet from me but in another world, you know, and I knew that they could see me, you know, but that they were ignoring me, you know, because they were in this other world. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so, you know, play starts, I, you know, I'm recognizing all the scenes, you know, and then um, here comes the court scene, you know, because Polonius and Gertrude, you know, that their first scene. And then there's like, a, you know, a lot of actors come on stage and then there's a, a young man in black, dressed black, um, short hair, leaning against the pillar, legs crossed, you know, just totally leaning back like this. 
And I was just like, oh, this is some extra, right? Because I knew like, that's not Laertes, that's not, you know, her, you know. Um, I was like, all right, so this is just gonna be some extra and I'm, I'm just gonna watch him, you know, cause he seems really kind of, kind of interesting. He's got an attitude, you know, uh, and an interesting look. And then he spoke Hamlet's lines, right? So I'm like, wait, what? You know, cause I know the play very well, we studied it. So then I'm like reaching my playbill under my seat and I'm like, oh, I was just like, oh, they realized it was a mistake, you know, and then they cast, recast the man as Hamlet, right? So I'm looking through the thing, but it says Hamlet's being played by Diane Venora. And I was just like, wait, what? And I realized, oh my God, that's her, oh. you know? And so, you know, when women play men, they read much younger. Hmm. So she, it, it made the play even more personal to me because she really seemed like a, like an 18 year old fuck up, you know? Yeah. Um, and um, I, just the whole thing, like I would just, you know, by the time the play ended, I was just like, wait, and then everybody, you know, even my classmates, right, sitting in my seats next to, you know, like, cause you can feel, right? That's the, that's the thing that you can't get anywhere else. The vibration of it, yeah. Totally, you feel the audience and all that stuff. And then afterwards, you know, my classmates just started talking and being regular people again. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, oh no. <laughs> I liked it better, you know, when we were in this other world and we were all agreeing. Um, so, you know, as the bus was pulling out, like I just, you know, we were driving down Broadway and I just saw these purple and white NYU flags. Um, and so, and it was senior year, you know, and people were, I was applying to colleges. And so I applied to NYU and I got in and I got a scholarship and, you know, I didn't go to Tisch, you know, I often get um, uh, included in Tisch things, but I didn't go to Tisch. <laughs> I blame you, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so thinking about like your time and, you know, in first arriving in New York and like, um, the downtown theater scene. I guess I'm curious. So I have a, a two-parter question, which is, you know, I know fourth grade, the essay was on the wall, but something that I think about a lot is like when you sort of want to become a writer and then when you feel like you can tell somebody I'm a writer. Um, so that's the first part of my question. The other part is just thinking about, you know, like the difficulties that you had sort of entering the theater world. And again, thinking about our audience, like advice that you have, you know, I know that you're, you're always a strong supporter of being proactive and, and, and just cutting through. Cause I think it's intimidating, especially if you, um, it's just intimidating to find your way in. You think like, do I have connections? Like who am I to do, to approach anything, especially if you don't live in a hub, right? I think some people think you have to have the degree or the accolade or it's just, it's the writing, you know? So yeah, I threw a lot at you, but however you want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't write, so I didn't go to Titch. I just went to the regular College of Arts and Science. And I, my degree is actually in literature, right? Um, in dramatic literature. So I read plays because I was just like, what is, you know, as discovering plays as a senior in high school. So I was like, let me read some plays. Um, and then I got, a, a, you know, an internship at La Mama. And, but I was doing everything there. Like during the day, I was an intern in the office. At night, I was on running crew for whatever show needed me. And then on the weekends, I worked at the box office. You know, so I, I, you know, I, my theater education just came as a result of my initiative. And, you know, I, I don't, you know, and I don't have a graduate degree. I didn't, didn't study playwriting, you know, um, you know, when I was a Korean American kid from Dover, Delaware, you know, suddenly, you know, you know, graduated with a degree that meant nothing and could get me no job. Um, so it was just like a survival instinct, mm. you know what I mean? And, um, you know, and I took jobs, like, you know, I was a waitress and I taught English as a second language and I did copy editing and, you know, the day that the reviews for Stop Kids came out, I still had to finish my freelance work of writing Star Trek trivia questions for the Sci-Fi Channel website um, because I had gotten behind during rehearsals. Um, 
So, um, you know, I, because I had no safety net, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, nobody was going to help me with my rent. And, you know, so I had to work, you know, but I also, I did briefly take like a corporate job right out of NYU. So, you know, just an assistant, you know, at um, um, first three executives at a PR corporate, you know, international corporate PR firm and like men. Like, so I would like take up, you know, I would like ride my bike from Avenue A to Midtown. And I would like literally change in the bathroom, like superhero. You know what I mean? Because like I wanted to be me up until the moment I couldn't be me anymore, right? And then I put on like you know skirt, you know, and a top and and stuff. But that's a kind of job where literally you are looking at the clock, going like, oh my god, two and a half hours. You know what? You know because you're just answering the phone and typing and you know stuff like that. And I was just like, oh my god, I can't. You know, I can't live like this. Um, so that's when I quit and I, you know, started cobbling together freelance jobs. It was just like, again, survival instinct, which is like, I, if I don't do this, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have any connections. My parents didn't know anybody. You know what I mean? Um, I had no relationship with anybody. So it was like, all I got is my work. You know, that's the only thing that's going to help me. So, you know, when I wrote plays, I wrote, you know, I was like, I, I, uh, you know, I don't know if people do this anymore, but these 10 minute play festivals, you know, like just a bunch of friends, we kind of get together and put these on and raise money, totally big sales, you know, paying for, you know, like that kind of thing. I self-produced my first full length, you know, play. Um, Kate Worski actually produced it. <laughs> we met because we were waitresses together at a pizza restaurant. Um, um, but you know, it just, I just knew there was just no question that if I didn't make it happen, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, and you, you were able to push through, I mean, cause that's a lot of work. You're able to push through kind of like the doubt or that work, like not having a safety net sounds like you were still able to sort of have that force of will to just keep, to keep writing, keep working, keep collaborating. Yeah. yeah. It, honestly, it, there was a a desperation to it as well, you know, just because I, I did taste that corporate life. Uh -huh. And I was just like, I'm not doing this with my life. You know what I mean? Like that, just that whole thing. I mean, it's so much to do with like environment too. Just in other words, the people who I spent the day with and the conversations that I was overhearing. And I was just like, this is a very judgmental thing, but I just felt like people aren't really living and thinking and feeling deeply here. People are just kind of performing. And it's something that I, working in my parents' drugstore um, in, in Milford, Delaware, um, you know, like it was interesting because, you know, you interact with people. And of course, like in retail businesses, right? You, what do you say? How's your day? How would you weekend? You know what I mean? Like you have these rote conversations, right? And you know, you know, and people would have these folksy things. They would say like, "Hot enough for you?" <laughs> you know? And but I just realized, like, I was having these conversations that that said and meant nothing, mm. you know. And I just, it just like even as a kid, and I didn't know, like, I didn't have like, I'm gonna grow up and you go to New York City. I didn't know that. You know what I mean? So like, but all I knew was just like, that seems like death to me. You know what I mean? Your, your antidote for having conversations that mean nothing is to then write conversations that mean a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great, <laughs> great way. I just, yeah, I just, yeah. it's just like, why are you bothered saying mm -hmm. these things, you know, to each other? They mean nothing. Now, of course, I'm only giving them their packs of cigarettes and you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, so, but you could, do you know what I mean? You could just stop and have an interesting conversation with people. I did. And my dad is the pharmacist. He did, you know what I mean? Like some, I mean, he, he had a lot of those dumb conversations too. Um, <laughs> being so, I'm old now, so I can say this, but like, you know, but you know, he, he, you know, my dad would sit and he would talk to them. My dad always said that pharmacist knows his, their patient, the patient better than the doctor. He mm. said, for the doctor to see them for like 15 minutes, he says, 
to me, they come in, they pick up their prescription, they say, like, you know, like my dad will be like, how does how is this compared to the last, you know, your other prescription? Or, mm -hmm. you know, how's this how's this making you feel? Like, it makes me feel sleepy, dog. You know, and like yeah. you know I, mean? I yeah. guess in like a small town, it's kind of like the pharmacist knows all your secrets, right? <laughs> like he yeah. knows what's up with everybody. Um, there's definitely there's definitely a play in that, I think. Um yeah. what so I guess I'm interested in sort of like, what is your most, do you have a play that you feel like is your, or not even just a play in terms of other writing as well, but something that's the most autobiographical or the play that where you felt the most sort of vulnerable or scared, you know, which is like the, um, the closest to the bone piece of writing in a way, or maybe that changes, but whatever comes to your mind. They all are. I mean, because I think, I mean, I, 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 you know, we're in a very interesting moment in time in terms of, you know, I think, as an Asian American, you know, and I, I, I'd love for you to chime in on this as well, but like just coming into consciousness a little bit more. It's not like I haven't known that I'm Asian American, but like, I feel like I have been the kind of person to say like, oh no, it hasn't held me back, or oh no, people hasn't, don't treat me differently. But I don't think that's true. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, um, um, uh, anyway. So, so I felt like I so, and I've chosen not to write about myself autobiographically, which I think is on the one hand is an artistic choice, but I think on the other hand, there is that kind of like when you don't see yourself represented, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, in, in, in the media that you consume, it's not necessarily your reflex to then put yourself up there. It depends who you are, who I am. I didn't write that way. Um, but I do feel like I'm completely exposed in all of my plays. Like, I cannot believe <laughs> how exposed I am, mm. but they're not autobiographical. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do think there is a more autobiographical play to be written. I'm not exactly, I haven't found that, mm. you know, that one thing about it yet. Do you know what I mean? You can, it's uh, kind of like lurking in the distance, like calling your name. It is. Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's some aspects, you know, I mean, people, you know, I, I, there are a number of experiences in, you know, that I've had that people were like, oh my God, you have to write about that. And I'm like, what's the story? Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I understand that that was an interesting experience that I lived through, but what is the narrative? Of it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, like, I can't see what I can do, what part of that story I can tell in my minutes in which, you know, there's the things that we need to tell a story. You know what I mean? Like, a, you know, an action, an inciting event, a transformation, you know, all those kinds of things. So, um, uh, but I also think perhaps there is one and it's quite obvious and I just don't want to tell. Yeah. Um, so I have a message saying that in about five minutes, we're going to start asking some questions from the audience. So folks, please email out your questions. Um, and yeah, I mean, so I will say one of the ones I see here um, is just thinking about how to become a stronger writer. This one in particular is about dialogue or exercises. I was actually just thinking about all the conversations that you probably overhear overheard in your dad's pharmacy, but do you have any do you have any advice in terms of like developing your ear as a playwright? Hmm. Or any kind of, I mean, I, I guess you say dramatic writing in general, since you you're a go between. Yeah, is I don't know. Is that's interesting because I mean I, I am somebody, again, this is so snotty, but like I'm somebody who can tell on the first page if I'm going to enjoy reading something or not, whether it's a novel, you know, or play, usually something right away grabs me or doesn't, or speaks to me, you know what I mean, um, about the language. So I, I guess pay attention to like, you know, when you're reading, like what, you know, if you feel like I'm in, when you're reading a play and you're like, I'm in right away, you know, pay attention and dissect it. Like, you know, like, that, and I might do some of this work in the workshop next week, but it's like, you know, it's really, really valuable to like, to actually take apart, you know, plays and, or TV shows or movies that you like, like to reverse engineer them, mm -hmm. see what the beats are, 
you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's helpful. But also, I guess the question is about dialogue. But it's just like, you know, I would just go through a play and just circle certain lines that you just love. You know what I mean? And just think about it and articulate it, write it down. You know, what do you love about that line? What about it saying to you, you know? Um, yeah, that's really good advice in terms of reverse engineering. I think a lot about the different levels of dialogue, like the very direct way of saying it. I mean, for me, exposition is is always, I mean, I get jealous of Shakespeare. I'm like, you can just put it all at the top and then it's done with. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, how do you fold something in? And then like, what makes that dialogue really memorable? I think there was something about the way a play like crack and crackle or a novel, anything where you really feel mm -hmm. the, the voice of the writer. I think that I feel like that was what I was imagining you were talking about when you said the first page where you feel like, Things are alive or not, um, and then I don't. I, how? What is your feeling about uh, rewriting? Because I was and the th thought I have for dialogue is that you can spool it out and have a lot of dialogue, bad dialogue, the full version, and then you know cut it shorter. Or Carol Churchill for one playwright, she just folded the page a bit, but it's a lot of different mm -hmm. techniques. Yeah, I mean, look, I always tell other people like just write, you know, like just write it as bad as it is, just get it out you know, get it on the page. Like I have friends who call it their dirty draft. You know what I mean? That they go, you know, very accomplished writers. And they're like, we just do a dirty draft first. And they're like, it's awful. You know what I mean? Like we would never want anybody to read it. It's so bad, you know, but then, you know, but then we work with it. I, I, I advise it and I, I, you know, uh, encourage it, but I am not a, able to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have a fear of somebody finding my rough drafts and reading them and saying, this is a piece of shit and she has a town. So like, I will like rewrite like the first seven pages a hundred times, you know, and, and you know, and, uh, just because if I rewrite the first seven pages set a, a gajillion times, then they get better, like those pages get better. And I find the rhythm and I find the language and I find the characters, you know, and then I can move on. Um, but I was, I would, I would say like, I mean, if we could do this kind of thing and say like, let's say a writing process is like a year long, right? I would say I spent three months rewriting the first seven to 10 pages. Again, don't, I don't recommend it. But what I have noticed over time is that that is my process. And I try not to get frustrated with myself anymore and just accept that that's my process, you know, and, and be at peace with it. And so once you, I'm fascinated by this, and I leave another question about sort of your method for and how you do play with structure in terms of starting a play. And so is it about having that seven to 10, like feeling authentic, and then you can sort of move forward? I mean, do you know, um, I guess I'm thinking specifically about stop kiss, but you know, like, do you know your ending, or is it? Do you see a part that's most clear, or is it really about nailing the beginning and then moving forward? You usually know the ending, hmm. yeah, or or something towards the end before I can even start. That's me personally. Um, I know people who just like to discover, you know what I mean. But I feel very at sea. You know, I, I like to know what I'm driving towards. That's, you know, me personally. Um, and so what usually is like frustrating for me, what makes me rewrite those first three pages is I'm like, these lines, like I'll just look at some dialogue, the first X number of lines of dialogue and I'll be like, these lines are not driving me towards, you know, the first goal, whatever the first goal is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, you know, and the second goal or the third goal. Um, you know, I think you know the, the the dialogue that I do. That's my voice. You know, is quite you know natural language, but it is highly cramped. You know, um, I, it, and it's very rhythmic to me. I can definitely like if I if I write one day and I open it up the next day and I'm just like, oh my god, the rhythm is all off. You know what I mean? And then I usually cut, usually I'm always cutting, you know, but I'm cutting or I swap out words or whatever. It's about honing and sharpening, but I want everything to be as potent as possible, to be driving 
you know, but it sounds like, you know, I think people, uh, you know, think it sounds like everyday language, you know, but it is, it is so labored over. <laughs> And do you have, this is another one of our questions, do you have a certain amount of time that it takes you? I mean, for me, my answer is it's wildly different, but to, to get to a first draft, I mean, is there kind of a, a ballpark amount of time um, for you to reach it? Does it kind of spill out of you? And like, how heavy is your, how heavy is your research? Yeah, it's, well, I mean, it's very hard for me to talk about writing times just because like, you know, I have another job and I have three kids. So like, you know, the writing happens like, you know, but, you know, when it, when it can happen, and, you know, and a lot of times in terms of clarity, it doesn't happen at all, right? Like I haven't been able to write these play for years. I actually do have one that I haven't put out there yet because I need an, uh, I have to do another rewrite. Uh, it's not quite uh, uh, what I want it to be. Um, I was working on it um, at, at Sundance. Yeah. 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 Um, but um, you know, what I would advise, because not everybody has the issues time time management issues that I have is what I advise is making an appointment with yourself to write every every day and put it in your iPad, you know, and just identify because everybody's juggling all kinds of crap, right? But just to identify what is an achievable amount of time that you can work on writing and do nothing else. Right. So turn off the internet, you know, and like you know, and then have like a notepad, right? So that if you're writing and then you go like, oh my God, I have to email that person. Then you write it on the like, notepad, you know, or you're like, oh, I have to buy bananas. Then write it on the notepad, but don't use your notes program. Don't open an email, don't text yourself, don't text anybody, you know? And so even if that amount of time is only 20 minutes, you know what I mean? But like, just make a commitment and use it kindly, you know? Um, and like when the 20 minutes are done, it's like hands off, hands up. It's like on uh, all those cooking reality shows, you know, <laughs> they're like times up, hands, you know. Put your knives step away from the design. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I, it, yeah. yeah, it's better to be, I mean, obviously you have to, you have to decide this for yourself, right? And it might vary day to day, but it's like, I, I used to always push myself to go beyond, to, finish the scene or to finish the section or like whatever it was, whatever my little unit was. Um, but then what happens is the next time you go to sit down, it's so hard to start back up again because you're like, ah, I feel a sense of accomplishment. I feel like, you know what I mean? Like, ah, I did something. Whereas if you just like, you know, put your knives down um, yeah. and then you pick it up the next day, you know where you want to go. You know, because mm -hmm. I mean? so, you leave it, it's, it's, it's more abrupt. You sort of leave it unfinished. So you know that you want to yeah. just keep going. Yeah. yeah. And, and was that technique something that would help you when you were juggling the many jobs and, and working? Yeah. Oh. I know. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, the truth is, I should do it. <laughs> um, so another question we have that I have. Um, it's just, you know, I mean, you've, <laughs> you've done an incredible amount of work in, in television as a, as a showrunner and working on a number of, you know, amazing shows. And it's just how, how has the TV writing process um, changed you as a writer? I think in terms of like writing, like the, you know, how has being a playwright changed writing for television and how has the television now changed you um, mm -hmm. as a playwright? You know, I, 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 I would have to say that, that, you know, working on that play, Jane says, it, the TV, it's just a totally different, I, it could be just my particular brain, but I can really section that off. And I don't, I don't feel like I bring um, my TV head to it. It's mm -hmm. just, a, it just, yeah, it just, where it lives in my head is just so different um, when I go to work on a play. Because there's, it, there's a lot of um, mystery to it. Like, <laughs> like people will say like is this how you imagined it you know like the set designer or, and i'll be like or, like because i don't really like i don't see my place like that's just again that's me but i'm not a very visual person like i often in movies or things like i miss some storytelling elements if it's purely visual if it's somebody just doing an action 
like, and then that's supposed to be a turning point in the movie. Oftentimes, like, I don't register it because I need language. Do you, uh, do you, can you hear your play or is it more really about how it exists on the page in terms of like when you're in the rehearsal? Oh, practice? I hear it. I, yeah, hear oh, it. I hear it, totally. And that's the thing is that that's my primary experience writing is hearing it. And then to me, it's all just people just like, they just talk like this. <laughs> um, uh, and TV rating, you know, that's so different. That's like, that's like an accumulation of like 20 years, you know, of just experience because I started as a staff writer. I worked at, like you are, you know, I worked my way up every level. Um, I worked for so many different people on so many different kinds of shows, um, for different networks that had different demands. Um, and so, yeah, writing for TV, it's much more, well, you have to sell it too, mm -hmm. right? Like in, in the theater, you write the play and then you try and get somebody to produce it. But in TV, you have to conceive of the, the, of the show in depth, you know? Here's what happens in season two. Here's what happens in season three. Before you even write a line of dialogue, right? So it's a really, TV writing is much more of an outside in kind of process. And to me, playwriting is inside out. And so speaking to that kind of inside out, I guess, so this is sort of piggybacking off a question we have is when you're writing work that's very intimate, um, how do you dig deeper? Like, what are your methods for pushing past what might become like a, a personal emotional plateau? So how do you get to sort of like really getting into the heart of it? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, you just gotta go, it's that thing, what, whatever you do for you, but it's like, what are you afraid of, mm -hmm. you know? And then you can, if you can, like I said, like I tend, I'm not a journal writer in it because it's all evidence, again, that's gonna be found and to to incriminate you later. But if you are a kind of person to journal, I would journal about it. I would be this is what I'm afraid of. And I, and I do, I mean, I have done it, you know, uh, I don't write on paper, I write exclusively on my computer. And so like, you know, you can, I've done it and then delete it, you know? Um, but yeah, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid that if I write this scene like this, people are gonna think I'm stupid. People are gonna know that uh, this is my, you know, X, Y, Z is my biggest fear. You know what I mean? Like, and it's, it, it is very, uh, it is an exorcism, you know what I mean? To, to write about it because, you know, um, it's not that bad. Like once you write it, it's like not that bad. And then I just feel like, like I want to be moved when I go to the theater, you know? Cause I feel like it's a big deal. Like I came out of my house, <laughs> I traveled, paid a lot of money for ticket and now I'm gonna sit in the theater. And I what I know is that seeing a play could be is has the potential to be the most profound experience I could have outside of fun everyday life. So like use me, you know what I mean? Like please respect my time and like I'm I'm ready, break my heart, change my mind, blow my mind. You know what I mean? Like that's how I feel when I go to the theater. You know, and so, and I don't mean this in a way that's pressureful, but when I'm writing, I just feel like, how am I going to give that? How am I going to give an audience the experience that I want to have? Mm -hmm. You know, and then, it, and it's, you know, it's by being vulnerable. But then it's also, you know, I mean, again, I came up, you know, you know, these 10 minute play festivals, and sometimes it was just like, this is your diary. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, people would, you know, put stuff up. I'm like, this is just your diary. You know, like there's supposed to be some part to it, you know? And again, you are supposed to acknowledge that I'm here, you know, and that I have a role to play. So if you just tell me your story and all your feelings, I'm not actually doing it. Mm. Um, and I find it very frustrating as, as an audience. Do you feel differently? So in terms of your plays, when you're writing a play, do you feel... Do you come in with an objective like I want to make the audience cry or provoke them or or laugh? I mean, I know it's a complicated meal that you're offering. Yeah, it's more like this. Like I wanna, I wanna say like, <laughs> but I just sort of like, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like, 
<laughs> like, here's something I care about. Like, if it, like, I think anger is usually a, a part of everybody's process, right? Like, what well, you know, if we're passionate about something enough to write a play about it, then anger is a part of it as well. You know what I mean? And so, like, there's a part of like, I want to get, yeah, I want you to know that you have been a part of what's hurting my nature. Mm -hmm. I've never quite thought that before, mm -hmm. um, but that's that's kind of what I mean. You know what I mean? Like, there's a kind of like, there is usually a, I want you to see it. I, I guess that's sort of what it is. It, it does, I don't think when you read my place, you would get that, you know, but when it's just me alone, you know, I, I feel a little bit, I, I, I would like to shove the audience's face in something a little bit and just say, I want you to see this thing hmm. that I see that hurts me. And I don't think you see it because you are perpetuating it. Yeah, I love that. Well, part, a part of a question that I'm, I'm curious to answer. So um, for you is, is writing hard work and, you know, do you have any, I feel like you sort of gave us a, I have a question about more creative exercises to inspire. I feel like you sort of gave us the write every day for the 20 minutes, but, but the first part is just like, is writing hard work or, you know, does it, does it depend on right. you know, where that you're yeah. telling, where you're at? Yeah. Well, and also in terms of 20 minutes, it's whatever amount of time that yeah. you've identified, you can, yes. you can focus exclusively on, you know what I mean? It could be two hours. If you've got two hours and you're not going to check your email or your tax or anything like, and you've got, God love you. Um, but um, say it again, sorry, I lost it. Oh, just, I guess is, is writing, is writing. Oh, it work? oh yeah. Oh yeah. Everybody hates it. I mean, I hate it. Everybody hates it. But, mm -hmm. but. I will say this, that once I get it going, mm -hmm. you know, and it's usually in the rewriting, I'm a huge, like to me, like if you asked me, I would actually say I'm a rewriter. <laughs> um, again, because I don't love the dirty draft. You know, I don't love the process of getting it out. I, I think it's just like, again, it's evidence that I'm a horrible writer, you know, and it's in the rewriting that I go like, hmm, <laughs> I like the way that sounds, or this is, this is kind of pretty good. Um, but, um, yes, it is, it is, yeah, it's hard work, but, uh, it's rewarding work and it does get, there is a, there is, you know, uh, a point at which it does become like, this is going well, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like for me, it's like, this is going well, like, and like, for example, this project that Gina and I have been working on for a long time. We gotten some notes and she was from the network and she was kind of like confused by it. And I was just like, we're in the zone. We're in the zone. There's actually, there's nothing that we can do wrong. You know, yeah. we just have to make some choices mm -hmm. about, you know, how we're going to address this note, but we're in deep, we're in it and nothing we write is going to be bad. And I think that's the sense of also from the talk back, right? It's like when to put on, I don't want to say the blinders on, but when you sort of know the path to go. And I, I find this is true whenever I get uh, rewrite notes or feedback or Q&A from an audience, right? It's kind of like sometimes people can help identify um, a problem part of the play or their questions, their feedback is helpful to say, okay, here's a part that they don't understand, but it's not necessarily from this feedback that their solution is is correct. It's just flagging. Okay, I have to make them understand in my own way, or their confusion is fine because I will eventually address it. You know. Yeah, it can be either of those. Like sometimes they're, I didn't understand. That's fine. I didn't want you to understand that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're gonna, you're gonna know later, right? But that, that's the kind, yeah, that's the kind of thing they have to talk about. I didn't understand, but did you understand it later? Yeah. Okay. So it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what was the first part of that thing that you said, just said that right now? I don't know anymore. Okay. It was just really about like when, you know, when talking about sort of how to process feedback, I think that there's something, I, I like what you said when you're in the zone and you have that surety, because I think that similar to the talk back thing, you can get overwhelmed by trying to sort of please too many people, or you can lose, you know, it's like you're holding on to a kite tail of your own play or your own story. And if you're trying to please everybody else, 
you lose the core of it. And yeah. so, I mean, that's why I think the list of questions is really helpful. It's because, yeah. because again, it forces you to identify for yourself, what did you want out of this draft? What did you hope to accomplish with this draft? Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. So in terms of your collaborations, I wanted to talk about collaborations with directors, you know, in terms of like different versions of plays that happen. I mean, how, what is your way in when you sort of begin the relationship of like a new, like brand new play with a director? Can you speak to any, mm -hmm. any experiences? Yeah, let me think. Well, Michael, I think Michael, I've directed both Boy and Satellites. And each time it was like the play was written and then, you know, we came and we had a conversation about it. Not gay, but, you know, you know, enough to know that we wanted to work together and we had many conversations about it. Um, and, but Joe came in, Joe Bonnie came in very early writing in some ways. I mean, I did have a draft, you know, um, but um, uh, yeah, very different. Like Michael, Michael's very big picture, you know what I mean? And he'll say like, you might want to take a look at this transition or you might want to take a look at the scene. I don't think it's quite publishing what you want to accomplish. Um, whereas Joe is like really like A plus dramaturg, like just not that Michael's not the same wrong. But like she's really like in it with you, like a writer. I think that's that was my experience. Like that Joe was almost like having a, a co-writer who didn't write. You know what I mean? And then mm -hmm. Michael was really very much a director. But oh, I this is gonna, you know, which is you're always gonna get all kinds of notes, right? Like, and you just have to identify, and that's why the list is helpful. But it's like you just gotta pick like does the note help me tell the story? I want you know, and not get, and this is the thing that happens in talkbacks, sometimes go like, oh, I thought, I think it would be very interesting if she decided she wanted to be a scientist. And people are like, oh gosh, that is interesting. That would be a lot of you. But it's like, then you're writing a whole other play. You have to like, you know what I mean? Like sometimes other people have great ideas and it's a great idea, and it, you know, but it, if you don't want it in your play, you know, um, or then, you know, then it's just some, thank you very much, you know? Yeah. Um, so my next question is about your collaborations with actors. I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, we're all huge fans of Sandra Oh, obviously. She's incredible. And, and you know, I guess, what was the process? I mean, do you ever write with an actor's voice in your head? Or can you talk about sort of working with an actor on more than one play and, and that process? I, I think I read in another interview once that you had a little bit of, um, writer's block in between, like after Stop Kiss to the next one that she helped encourage you into satellites. Yeah, but I don't remember how many. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, I I do, well, well, the funny thing with Sandra is like, we had met in 1995 uh, on a workshopping a play of mine called Fishes. Mm -hmm. And she had just come to the States um, from Canada where she, she had, there's a lot of buzz about her, but uh, this movie called Double Happiness. Um, anyway, so she wanted to, you know, work on plays and she was in LA for some TV work. So Che Yu um, found her for me, said, are you interested in her? Do you want to work with her? Blah, blah. So <clears throat> first day of rehearsal, I walked in a few minutes late and that director was having them do some warm up exercises. And just the way that she moved her body and her voice and stuff, I was just like, I was like, who is this terrifyingly uninhibited Korean person? <laughs> I had never seen anybody like that. Um, and, um, but we had, you know, I mean, we got to know each other over the course of working on that play, but you know, uh, what I knew from the first day was just like, oh my God, she is so honest, mm. you know, and that she seemed to understand like my mindset, like, you know, like sometimes people come in, especially with Stop Kiss, they come in, they audition and they have like, and Callie's very sarcastic. And I'm like, there's not a line in there that I think is, you know, sarcastic. Um, you know, that's not how I write. Um, but, and Sandra gets that. She knows that, you know, that the intention is honest. You know what I mean? Even if it comes off as funny, even if it comes off as being, kind of smart alecky. Um, but I didn't think of her for Stop Kiss. I don't know, it just like, 
I had totally fallen in love with Jessica Hecht. Um, I went to see her in a play very early in my writing process with Stop Kiss. She's not the person that I was envisioning for that role because I was basing Callie on my best friend from college. She was like a working class Italian American girl. But like Jessica, like again, she was so real. I saw her in this other person's play and she was so real um, that I was just like, I have to have her in my play. Um, and then, but I wasn't done my play, I had like 10 weeks. Um, and then anyway, so we did a workshop of it and I, I cast somebody else as Sarah. And then I was working with Joe on some notes and Sandra was visiting LA and staying with me. And, she came to pick me up from Joe's office. And um, and she let, you know, she just exchanged a few words. She met Joe and said a few things. And, and she said, oh, wait, I'll wait for you. And, um, and Joe said, what about her? Right? And Joe didn't know her work at all. Mm. Said, what about her? And I was just like, she's, I was like, oh my God, really? <laughs> and she was like, yeah. She's like, she's just got that, you know, that really like, open, you know, quality without being naive. And I was just like, huh. <laughs> I was like, let me think about it, huh. And then of course, you know, then we, I did cast her in reading with Jessica and I was just like, well, this is just magic, those two. Um, but it's a level of trust. I know that she knows what my intentions are. Hmm. I'm not a snarky writer, you know, I think, <laughs> That's it, you know, I think people like snarky writing, you know, it's, you know, it's very smart, um, but I, uh, that's not my. But coming at it with a point of that honesty and intention, um, this feels really sacrosanct to like sort of like your voice and the stories that you, that you portray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, she, I know, yes. Mm -hmm. Her first read, usually there's some adjust, of course, there's always some adjustment, but it's just the level of trust, mm -hmm. you know, it's very high. Oh, wow. Well, so we're, this flew by for me. I could keep, you know, but we're, we're, we're sort of at our time now. Um, just wanted to thank you for like this lovely, this lovely conversation. Um, is there anything, if anything that I missed, any words you want to <laughs> conclude us with? I, mean, I, would, I just want to see if there's anything. Um, no, no, I think we got it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> no, we did it, yay. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks. much, Jana. I'm just, I'm very inspired as always by just, I don't know, your honesty and, and just light and inspiration and, you know, and also just like your, your work ethic. I feel like just finding a way to always keep the work coming and, and the way that you interrogate different subjects. I don't know, just very inspired. Yeah, and very very cool. you're, you're killing it too. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> Yay. All right. All right, well, bye, everybody who we can't see. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>